finally rolling. Did you think we'd ever get there? <laughs> Good. Here we go. That goes a long way back. Yeah. It goes back to really when I was just uh, uh, No, no. <coughs> ah. Ah. I don't know that I... Hmm? You okay? No. Oh. Not very. Oh. <coughs> Would you like to stop? We can stop. Okay, okay. Just take your time. Yes. <coughs> There's no rush. Yes, David, I think there's always been something in me that wanted uh, more than was apparent in the ordinary course of life as it was unfolding in my teenage years and so on. And I remember very well uh, my gratitude when I came back halfway through the war uh, to get married to Carol Parfit. And this was 1942, and my best friend and best man, Tom Daly, his mother gave us as a wedding present P.D. Uspensky's uh, uh, In Search of the Miraculous. No, no. It hadn't been published then. Oh, okay. It was the new model of the universe. Oh, okay. The new model of the universe. And believe it or not, we took that to Mont Tremblant on our honeymoon, and we actually found some time to read it, both of us, really? because we both had the same impulse to search for something other than what life seemed to be dishing up, which was a mechanical series of events. One uh, did certain things and uh, reproduced, got old and died, and that was it. No, there's something that we need to serve. In order to become able to serve it, we have to purify ourselves in a way. I felt that early on, and all the uh, preliminary work that my parents had done with me in taking me to Sunday school and introducing me to the Bible, which I'd studied carefully, really? Old Testament and New Testament. That was a good beginning, but it was only a beginning. And I had to come to realize that there was something running through the whole breadth and length of civilization from the earliest times in every culture. Really? You realized that? Early um, on. Early on. And... Was this from Ospensky's? <laughs> when I got to Greece uh, as a beginning diplomat a few years later, uh, we had become friends with uh, the British ambassador's wife, especially, because I took her skiing. <laughs> she loved skiing, and so did we, and we took her skiing frequently. And finally, uh, we had the courage to invite them both to come to our house for lunch before we left to return to Ottawa. And they were looking at our books, and they picked up this copy of our Spensky's 
new model of the universe, and they said, this interests you? And we said, yes, more than anything else. And they said, well, when you get back to Ottawa, try and find Lord Pentland in New York, because he is connected with P.D. Ospensky's teacher, G. Iger Jeef. And I think that is what will interest you most substantially. And that's our gift to you on leaving. And we're very grateful to them, or I'm very grateful to them still, for that introduction, because we did eventually get just too late to meet his, to meet Gurdjieff. He had died a few months earlier, but uh, we were, even by the next year, 1951, uh, uh, I was able to get uh, uh, an appointment as uh, deputy uh, permanent representative at the United Nations. And that meant we could be living on Madame Spensky's farm. Outside New York. Outside New York at Mendham, New Jersey. And we had four years there where I was commuting every day and uh, very deeply engaged in all the work of the United Nations. Many times there was no head of mission because my boss had been uh, really run out of town by Senator McCarthy, pillaring him as a communist. Really? And uh, um, it got to the point where uh, uh, Herbert Norman, my boss, was sent as high commissioner to New Zealand to get him out of the way. And eventually uh, he became high commissioner uh, or ambassador in, in Egypt. This uh, was in what years were you at the UN? In the 50s. In the early 50s? 51, yeah. 55. 55, okay. So. In those years yeah. when uh, uh, Pearson was running for uh, Secretary General and Doug Hammarskjöld won out very comfortably. Uh, I don't think Pearson was disappointed because they became instant friends yeah. oh. and buddies in the uh, reinvention of the UN, yeah. peacekeeping, and all of that. And I had a front row seat yeah, yeah. at all of that event. Uh, it was an extraordinary time for me, I bet. and yet I could feel there too that what we were missing was uh, some deeper understanding of consciousness of what it means to be a complete human being. So, but this is through the work that you're yes. doing on the farm. Yes. yes. Yeah. So you had. Five years there? Four years there? Four years there. And you were doing the work when you weren't at the U.S. Yes, yeah. yes. And, or or playing, the, playing the role of diplomat, or actually functioning yes. as a diplomat. Yes, functioning as a deputy in charge of the delegation, in fact, mm -hmm. most of the time. <coughs> when Pearson wasn't there himself, uh, yes, it was... Uh, a tremendous opportunity for me at a very young age. Uh, One of the things about the work that's always struck me is its openness and even support of other spiritual traditions. It's, it's, it's perception that basically from a certain point of consciousness we're, we're basically looking at different, different paths up the mountain, if you will. So that's always struck me when I've read anything to do with Gurdjieff's work or Ospensky. Um, so that must have opened you to when you went to your, your first post was in Ceylon, Ceylon uh, uh, after the UN. Uh, well, uh, before that, I was in Paris. Oh, uh, oh right, that's right. Uh, in, in the late 50s. Yeah. And I was the deputy representative again at NATO. Right. 
uh, under Jules Leger at that time. And this was in Paris before NATO was moved to Brussels. And again, I had the opportunity to be with my Gurdjieff peer mentors. Madame Saltzman was there and uh, was going to uh, Gurdjieff groups under her direction at the Institute Gurdjieff. Uh, it was there that uh, we were beginning to explore, uh, uh, for instance, on weekends uh, when I could get away. I, my, Carol had discovered that there was uh, an early Christian church, the earliest Christian structure in Europe, uh, in a fourth century apse in Poitiers, only a couple of hours drive southeast of Paris. So we drove down there, and there was this apse with tiles uh, on, the, on the inner face and a figure of Christ teaching. Not Christ on the cross, but Christ the King right. teaching. And underneath, an indication of what he was teaching, just two words in Latin, ego sum, I am. I am. And we went back to Paris, and almost the next week, Madame Saltzman began giving us Gurdjieff exercises on I am. You know, it was so extraordinary, linking up with what Christ had said himself before Abraham was, I am. And he, he was all the time uh, saying, I can't do anything of myself. It's, it's only when I am one with the Father, God talking to Moses, I am that I am. So in the Christian, Hebraic, Syrian, Greek, Islamic, all, all these, all these uh, 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 civilizations were uh, permeated by that yeah. at a certain level. You're saying different paths up the mountain. I'm saying the closer you get to the top of the mountain, you more you see the same path. Same path. Yeah. Yeah. I call it different names, but essentially the same practices that are able to produce in somebody an attention that is not glued to some association cropping up and telling you what you should think or do or be, but open without any commentary, just to watch and take it all in and be present at that moment as fully as possible. Unconditional presence. When I was five, four years with a, a, Hindu, a Hindu teacher in Sri Lanka, or five years with a Sufi sheikh in, in Tehran later, or uh, five years in India with uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama and his top teachers in, in Mahamudra and Dzogchen, helping me to understand that there is really only one source for all these. And how could it be otherwise? How could the source be multiple? It's, the multiplicity comes because our associations are diverse and pulling us away into all kinds of speculations and fantasies and distractions. But when we're able to disengage from that kind of automatic automaton, then 
we can see the unity behind and above, including, permeating, unifying everything that is real. No reality other than that. That's a wonderful thing. Mm. But it, it, this is not my day-to-day -day experience, I <laughs> confess. It's, it's, it's uh, uh, what I have touched a few times in a full sense, and often in a partial glimpse, but not my day-to-day -day experience. My day-to-day -day experience, like yours, I expect, is that we no, no, struggle. I, I, I rest in the absolute 24-7. <laughs> we struggle to keep aware that there is this force keeping us asleep, yeah. the, the automaton yeah. keeping us asleep. And consciousness is the alternate force that we have in us if only we'd let it uh, be, be dominant instead of subservient, waiting for us to disengage. As soon as we're purified enough of that automaton, then we can be in this extraordinary state in which there seem to be no limits of time or of space. It's always now, and it's always here. Uh, Gurdjieff, in his Struggle of the Magicians, which uh, was performed in Paris in 1922, I think, uh, 22 or 23, uh, and <clears throat> In that, the white magician says, O oh Lord, and all your helpers, help me to remember myself so that I may avoid automatic manifestations, since it is only through them that evil can enter thy creation. Nicely put. Yes. Yeah, very nicely said. Back to the work. I think we kind of left it. You, were, you had met Madame de Salzman and she had given you some exercises to do. Were you, did you feel you were making progress as you were doing those exercises? Not much. Mm. Very slow. I'm a slow learner. <laughs> and I don't think it's possible to change everything in one's brain and one's nervous system, one's body, mind, and feeling. Uh, all at once. You can get a, a glimpse of that that's given a kind of grace sometimes. All the saints and, 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 and great teachers testify to that. But they all say uh, you have to start by recognizing that you're asleep. And then the awakening is these moments that are given when something of a higher energy allows you to experience this completely altered state, which is real, and you know it's real. Even when you haven't got it anymore, you remember it as real and nothing else can compare or be called real after that. Everything else is just partial and approaching. Sometimes I wake up in the morning and say, thank you, I'm here. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> at your age. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and you know, 
uh, there is this sense of, uh, yes, there's uh, some ability uh, gradually to feel a connection that is not just what the body wants. Uh, yeah, not the body, uh, the body or and the... Yet, or and the, yet the body yeah. is enormously important. I'm not denigrating the body. Without the body, I wouldn't be able to do anything or be anything. I need an awareness of the body that is not tied to the automaton part of the body. That's it. We have these two, tender, two currents going through us, the automaton current and the, what do you call it, leviton current, <laughs> gravity and levity. <laughs> gravity and levity. But I like something yeah. pulling me in a different hot direction yeah. back to a present, to, to a recognition that that's what I'm here to serve, yeah. not just, but until I have repeatedly rub my nose in my sleep, in my inability to do anything myself that is real. Then when I give up trying to do it myself, maybe it can enter and help. When I arrived in Sri Lanka, um, I had introductions through a dear colleague of mine who'd been uh, with me and uh, studying with Madame Saltzman both at Mendham and, and again in Paris, uh, Sir Peter Ramsbottom, Kajif, Adept, and uh, he had introduced me to his brother's mentor, who was Yoga Swami. And I went up and made an appointment after I'd been there a couple of months to visit Yoga Swami. And uh, he had a little hut in Jaffna, very modest place, and I knocked on the door. And he shouted back, is that the Canadian High Commissioner? <coughs> and I said, well, Swami, that is what I do, but not what I am. <laughs> and he said, in that case, come in, <laughs> sit with me. He gave me the most direct message, <coughs> not at that first meeting, of course, but after he got to know me better, and towards the end of our time together, he sat me down and he said, what do you think you're doing? Jetting all over the world and talking to everybody. What you need is to sit quietly and say to yourself, who am I? Who am I? Who am I? He said it like that? He said it like that. He was the same tradition as Ramana Maharshi, you know. Paul Brunton uh, and, uh, was his most visible English disciple. And one time, they were sitting on the ashram in a mountain just outside of Madras, uh, Tiruvannamalai, uh, and uh, Brunton asked him, uh, uh, what do you do all the time? You just give darshan. Uh, you don't tell them anything. Oh, he said, I'm busy going up and down 
a mountain in my elevator. And in a way, consciousness is this elevator, isn't it? Yeah. Because there isn't just one level of consciousness. It's such a magnificent spread from the automatic shit consciousness, you could, could chief called it. He did. <laughs> <laughs> to something that is beyond words and beyond our ability to put it in words or in thought, because it is the source of thought, the energy. It's not, I don't think about it and therefore it is. It's the other way around. Being posted back in Ottawa after being in Ceylon, did you ever feel any kind of contradiction between the spiritual life and your career, the diplomatic life? To some extent. Uh, I think some of my colleagues looked askance at this uh, Russian, Caucasian, uh, Gurdjieff, who the hell is he? Do, or did you talk <laughs> about it with them? Uh, uh, it was well known yeah. that I had a Gurdjieff group uh, okay. in Ottawa. Uh, okay. And uh, uh, I even got a letter at one time from the head of my department, the Under Secretary of State for External Affairs, yeah. uh, saying, uh, it has come to my attention that you... Anything uh, that begins, it uh, has come to my attention. Yes. Uh, and uh, I said, yes, it's come to my attention too. And, that, and I never heard anything more about it. <laughs> well, they really can't, I guess they can't mix. But still, your more materialistically inclined colleagues probably did look at you as Oh, yes. As a guy who went native when he oh, was yes. out in the field. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, and uh, <coughs> uh, after all, I was uh, having Tibetans on the roof of Canada House in Delhi uh, day after day at dawn uh, <laughs> teaching me Dzogchen. And uh, 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 this was not unnoticed, and I didn't conceal it. <laughs> <laughs> How soon was it after you were posted to Delhi that you came in contact with the Tibetans? Almost immediately. You sought them out. And it was, uh, I think, through Carol, my wife, uh, uh, who had had a contact with uh, Trungpa Rinpoche oh. uh, in London and uh, uh, had told him, uh, look us up when, when you can. And uh, so he did. And he came in 60, 60 uh, well, I had already met the Dalai Lama by then and had some conversations with him about the possibility of getting Tibetans into Canada as refugees. Did you go up to Dharamsala or was, did you meet him in Delhi? In Delhi. Uh -huh. And uh, although I'd been to Dharamsala later, uh, and... Uh, 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 Dalai Lama had asked me at that time also if I could uh, help with the uh, uh, preservation of their sacred texts that were so secret that they didn't even allow their own people to see them. You had to be an advanced Rinpoche to view these exercises and texts. and. Uh, 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 he, he said, uh, 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 we, we can't trust the universities because they'll publish them eventually. Yeah. And so I said, sure. I got, bought a microfilm and a camera and uh, found a young Canadian 
a hippie who was anxious to help, and for, he spent a whole year uh, copying Tibetan texts uh, and returning them to the owners as without having made any c copy for us or anybody else. And those have now been the basis for the preservation of a lot of very valuable material. And we got uh, at least 500 families uh, into Canada by my asking uh, Pierre Trudeau, please intervene with your immigration people who are keeping them out because there's no computer entry for Nomad. <laughs> Was there any pushback from immigration on that? No, not at the time when they realized the prime minister was interested. <laughs> they don't push back on him. <laughs> and later, subsequently, I heard years later that they regarded the Tibetan uh, experiment as their most successful refugee movement ever. Yeah. Right. And it was copied by the Americans when years later, the Americans came to us and said, teach us how to do it. <laughs> uh, perhaps uh, I should mention uh, Thomas Merton. One of his accolades uh, I had known, uh, and I was asked through that channel to uh, arrange for Merton's contacts with the most interesting Tibetan teachers. So I lined up a, a series of uh, the great teachers, I thought, uh, and uh, when Merton arrived, uh, he came and see me privately and he said, I just want you to understand that this is not a, a protocol visit. I am not trying to see the Pope, <laughs> I'm trying to just see those who are spiritually the most interesting. And I said, well, rest assured, you can count on the Dalai Lama as number one. And he, when he made his acquaintance, he agreed. Uh, <coughs> but uh, we had a wonderful time uh, going around, uh, and I remember especially uh, his exchange after a weekend with uh, Chatral Rinpoche, uh, when Chatral, uh, who was still alive, uh, was saying thanks to his visit uh, he understood something about Christianity that he had not understood before. And Merton said, and you have told me what you, what you have helped me understand your uh, approach to and the similarity. We face similar problems and similar possibilities. And it was a wonderful moment of acknowledgement and I think it was from that that Merton had said in his draft journal that I saw uh, that he wanted a spiritual summit. No beginners, just the top people, the most experienced, so they could exchange on the basis of their experience and not just on the basis of their ideas. But that part of the uh, the Asian Journal was taken out. Uh, I was uh, editing it uh, at their request. Brother Patrick had uh, asked me to go over it because Merton had spelled everything phonetically. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to get the correct spelling put in the text. And so I realized when it was published that uh, the reference to a spiritual summit had not been, not made it into print, unfortunately. No. But <coughs> uh, I was uh, in hospital myself the last days he was in India, 
And uh, he came by and gave what he called a tantric mass for me, my welfare. And the next morning, Carol took him to the airport, and a few days later, he was in uh, Bangkok, and as you know, was electrocuted, uh, wet hands and a faulty shower circuit, uh, and it was uh, uh, it was killed. Uh, <coughs> well, how would you describe Burton as a person? Everyone, whatever they're really following, it's palpable that they have a freer attention and a presence that you can see and feel through the eyes, through the uh, what vibrations that are surrounding us as we speak mm -hmm. uh, with each other. It's, it's quite evident. And uh, the absence of it is also evident. Yeah. So many phony teachers mm -hmm. pretending because they have a few crumbs of knowledge that they can get you into heaven with your boots on. <laughs> <laughs> with your boots on. Um, speaking of how to recognize a genuine teacher, that takes us to Tehran, because one of your teachers in Tehran, you asked that question to. Dr. Durbach, a remarkable man. And Sufi? Sufi, the head of the largest Sufi organization in Iran. Unfortunately, when the mullahs came in, first thing they did was make it impossible for him to return. Mm -hmm. So he died in exile in London. But <clears throat> I remember uh, a remarkable luncheon that uh, we had together in his kanaga uh, during the time he was in Iran. And uh, <coughs> he had invited Sir Peter Ramsbottom, who was again the British ambassador, at the same time I was Canadian ambassador in Tehran. And uh, the guest of honor was Henri Corbin, the great French Orientalist who had translated all the great uh, Sufi writers into French. It was very interesting to watch the interplay between the two of them because Dr. Nurbaksh was much younger, 20 years younger than Corbin, and was very respectful and friendly and modest, but uh, trying to get him to enlarge his, his scholarly view into something more comprehensive. <laughs> and uh, he was saying, uh, you have to learn to trust the intelligence of the heart. And Corbin was saying, unless my reason tells me it's true, I can't believe. Gnosis, above all. And uh, they didn't really uh, get any further than that. But <coughs> a few days later, when Corban dropped in to see me and say goodbye, uh, We'd become friends over the years. Uh, and I dared ask him, is there anything you regret in your long life? And he said, yes, one thing. I regret having translated Heidegger so that Jean-Paul Sartre could misunderstand him. <laughs> That's great. <laughs>
Yeah. Well, that's the dilemma the, yeah. of the Western trained mind. It was the same dilemma for Pierre Trudeau when I took him around India uh, uh, in his first official visit, uh, only official visit to Mrs. Gandhi, and he spent uh, four days before that official visit going round with me visiting in uh, the great teachers of, of India. Hindu and Buddhist? Hindu, Buddhist, uh, Christian, uh, Jesuits he visited, oh, yeah, well. Tibetan, and, and but he was and, and the, uh, the last one, and perhaps the most interesting was Ananda Bhai Ma, a great um, Bengali lady saint, who he couldn't understand how it was possible for her to have such a grasp of his inner questions when she had never had a teacher, had never read a book, couldn't read a book, could barely sign her name, and was 75 years old. And yet she was obviously sensitive to exactly where he was in himself in his own inner search that he'd never spoken to anybody about. And after the meeting, he just shook his head and he said, Jim, was she talking about what Krishna Murti calls choiceless awareness? And I said, right on, Pierre. <laughs> he had read Krishna Murti, okay. So he'd read Krishna Murti. And he was interested in all that. And he was struggling with his Jesuit education, which wasn't ready to accept what, what St. Augustine said. God is everywhere. Nowhere God is not. You knew Krishnamurti? Uh, yes, I didn't know him all that well. I'd been a few times with him in India and had dinner with him at a friend's house with Mrs. Gandhi. And Mrs. Uh, Madame de Saltzman asked me several times to take her to Gestad. And I drove her to Gestad and we sat and listened to Krishnamurti's talks. And I remember very well on one talk uh, when uh, at a particular moment uh, uh, totally unexpected, I could hear, so to speak, what he was about to say just before he said it, as if I was hearing his thoughts. And then he expressed it in words, and I could hear it through the mic. And after the talk was over, I shared that experience with Madame Saltzman, and she said, oh yes, of course, all these practices have the same purpose. They're all one, one teaching, one truth. And I was reminded of that the other day in reading this remarkable new book of Susan Morrow's called The Dawning, the Dawning Moon of the Mind, about her unlocking the pyramid texts of ancient Egypt 4,000 years ago that have been revealed now in the Saqqara Pyramid. And the way she put it was so direct, she said, pure energy, I'm going to read this, Pure energy, the nature of light, underlies all. 
we emerge from and dissolve back into this radiant ground. Not only can you know this, you are this. And it's that that I begin to be sure of. And I have no longer any trace of skepticism left. I, so I, what, what happens when we die? When we die, the, if there is a sufficient being that has been formed by all these practices we've been given that come from a true source, a real esoteric source, ancient or modern, same thing, then there can be a second body, as they say, a body within the physical body that can endure the death of the physical body and persist much longer, not forever. There are degrees. And this is what we keep forgetting in the modern world because we're so disconnected from the sacred that we, we forget that at every moment there are a whole array of levels going on in us. And this is a stretch in our awareness to be aware of some of them as much as we can, to be aware of the source of the vibration, of the energy that we're feeling, and to know that we are a microcosm of that greatness. And in that sense, we can begin to feel a love for it, a love for the wholeness that we are, a love for consciousness, a love for being, and a love for this world that is so much in need of the contact human beings, when they're conscious, could provide for that great source of energy from which we all come, manifested into the universe. When you look around at planet Earth, circa this moment in time, yes. are you optimistic? I'm not pessimistic. Hmm. Uh, I think the best one can say is that we still have a chance. I think there is hope of consciousness, is strength, is way, the way Gurdjieff put it. Mm. Hope of consciousness is strength. And faith in consciousness, he said, is freedom. Freedom of attention. Freedom from this pull of the automatic as the only thing that we can be aware of. No, we can be aware of these two energies at the same time and even open to a third energy. Every time I am here fully for a moment, I can feel and know that the energy that I am feeling in me is not just mine. It's not just yours. It's the energy that has created the whole universe. And this energy is manifesting and creating, sustaining moment by moment as well as in that singularity we call the Big Bang. <laughs> and when we begin to accept that that is the greatest force in the world, and we have an experience, not just an idea, that this force 
is radiant, that the ground of being is radiant. The energy in each of us is a fragment particle of that radiance. The Tibetans say primordial goodness, basic goodness, Trungpa called it, and Gurdjieff was saying the same thing, that there is uh, the greatest force is what uh, I have my hope and my faith and my love for. And in that, I don't think I'm mistaken, because at these moments I have known its validity. I don't know that it's going to produce this world salvation. Perhaps this world is beyond that. But life will go on and manifest. And this truth that we've been talking about, the vibrant energy of goodness, there is a goodness behind all that is irrefutable and uh, cannot be uh, uh, just discounted by our puny imagination and skepticism and ignorance. That's where we're disconnected from our sacred selves. And the reconnection is what is giving me hope in our future. Because the world is being renewed moment by moment by this force. This is part of the whole sequence that we can begin to be part of and perceive in our awareness when we allow it to be free of its preoccupations with itself, with its little, little egotisms, its little impulses, habits, nonsense, all that. Yes, it's true, isn't it? And uh, we can leave it there, hopefully. <laughs>